I'm Erica LaRose, and this is Shuttlepod Show. This is a funeral, by the way. And yeah. somebody yells from the funeral, We know! <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> 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 and, I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I got busted. Oh, man. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of ShuttlePod. Today, we have very special guest, Sirach Lofton. We'll be answering your fan questions, doing the return of Star Trek trivia, and much more. I'm Erica LaRose, and now for your hosts, Connor Trenier and Mark Cartier, our hey. producer. Hey. hey, guys. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you guys doing? How are you? Oh, I'm great. Are you nervous? I'm very nervous. Yeah. I don't like being on camera. Well, uh, this not is... Not as handsome as you. This is producer Mark. That's not true. Oh, jeez. I'm going to This blush. is producer Mark. He, <laughs> he's, he's walked the 15 steps to go from uh, back there in the corner to being in the hot seat in the couch. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, treks and trekkers, we are thrilled to have as our guest today, he played Jake Sisko on DS9. He is the groundbreaking, trailblazing host of the Seventh Rule podcast. It's Rock Lofton. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for being here. Hey, thank you for having me, guys. And uh, thank you for being here last minute as well. This is sort of a, a last minute switch because of Dominic's injury. Uh, we needed a guest. We needed to push the show forward. So yeah. thank you for especially yeah. being a last minute. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and um, I, you know, I would be uh, remiss not to ask how Dash is doing. <laughs> oh, my gosh, not, Wash. Why is he so far away? Because he's not looking <laughs> great. We, we, <laughs> what's that scene in Tootsie where it's like, you know, how much, how far should we pull back? How do you feel about Cleveland? Is that why you have Parthos <laughs> on your lap as a distraction? Yeah, yeah. Look at the dog. <laughs> Look at the dog. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, let's get started. Um, you began this business young. Super young, yeah. What got you into it? Um, what got me into it was actually doing uh, a play um, as a fourth grader and doing a school play. What was it? Yeah, it was uh, a play about Martin Luther King's life. And uh, I got to play Martin Luther King in the play. Of course, there was only two black kids in the school, so I had a 50 50 chance. You know, I was doing good. <laughs> you gotta love those odds. That's right. Uh, you never get those odds uh, in LA. Me or him. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, afterwards, I got a nice kind of feedback from the crowd and a lot of love from the you know parents and teachers. So uh, that's when I first realized that I could do this, you know, memorize lines and perform on stage. Right. And then, uh, and then I got discovered in a park playing basketball not too far from here. I actually grew up not too far on this oh, you very did? block. Yeah, grew up on this very block. As a matter of fact, native. Oh wow! Yeah, um, right here on Melrose. And um, there's a park not too far from here called Poinsettia Park. And I was there with my mom and my sister, and I'm playing basketball. And there was a photographer that discovered me essentially at the park. And got me into the show business thing, got me an agent that was her friend. And once I got an agent, I was getting sent out on auditions and starting to book auditions at 10 years old. You and the other guy. Against well, no, there were more people at this point. Yeah, there were more people. There were more people. But my mom would take me to auditions. She was like, you know, doing being a, a studio mom, TV mom. Yeah. And she would drive me to different auditions and I would start booking commercials, you know, and that's basically my entr entrance into the business. You, you never had any notion of being an actor prior to your uh, groundbreaking role? Of <laughs> I mean, I didn't have much notions about or anything. anything. Oh, nine. Nine years, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my notion was cartoons <laughs> and cereal. And that was about what I was focused on. So, Did you uh, get pulled out of school? Uh, no, I stayed in school. I, I doubled... I double dipped. I, I maintain my public school, going to public school and acting. So by the time Star Trek came around, I was around, you know, 13, 13, 14 in that zone. And so working full time 
I did have to come out of school for when we were doing episodes, but I was still uh, enrolled into public school, not too far from here. And uh, went to Bancroft Junior High School, went to Laurel Elementary School, Fairfax High School, and then UCLA. So I, I kept myself enrolled in school. Wow. Hmm. Was that difficult? I didn't know another way. Yeah, so right. You just, mm -hmm. yeah. Were you having fun before Star Trek as a child, like doing all this stuff? Or? Yeah, you know, I, 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 the first job I got, the first audition I went on, I was a U.S. Army commercial. And um, it, you know, it was filming in Monterey. And my mom couldn't take off of work. And my cousin was just happened to be in here and he was old enough to be my guardian. So it ended up being my cousin and I going to Monterey on a little kind of small little prop jet type of thing, you know, not a big commercial flight, but a little thing. Like a puddle jumper. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was scared. Yeah. Those are fun. Those are <laughs> those little things. Are, they move with everything. They do. <laughs> And uh, so I was scared as hell. But when we finally got there, um, I remember whoever was the, uh, you know, directing that thing or assistant director of that project came up to me and handed me an envelope and said, this is your per diem for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was like $500 in there. It was looking crazy. Right. And at 10, I was like, uh. I don't think my parents know about this money. I think this is like off the books. I think this is. I think this I, is fun. I think this is fun. Yeah. So that the real question is, did you keep it hidden from your parents? Um, I spent it. Like, spent it. Uh, then and there. Then and there, pretty yeah. much, uh, you know, uh, renting bikes, going to the arcade, getting a bunch of candy and ice cream. Like, I, I, I went hard on that for <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. A little folding money in your pocket. Oh, I never had so much money. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the arcade and you get a 20 roll, you know, exactly. rolls and quarters, not right. just a dollar or two. So <laughs> I was really, I really, I spent that money. And that's when I realized, oh, I like this acting thing. This is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember how satisfying it was when you would put like $20 into one of those those quarter machines and just would go on ding and on and on and on on and you were uh, like, mm -hmm. yes. I'm in heaven. Yes. <laughs> and um, then I thought, and they have food on the set. So I'm like, why are they giving me this money for me? <laughs> yeah. I'll just eat all these bagels and stuff. So uh, actually, I really learned. That was my entrance into the game. And I realized, well, I, I like this acting thing. They treated me really nicely. And I you know, got a trailer and a wardrobe. And everybody was really cool to me. So uh, he left a good impression. On I'm sure. Kid. I'm sure. I mean, and also, you know, the, the difference between, geez, I don't know, anybody's home versus work home, you yeah. know? Yeah. You've got a spotlight following you around and they're catering to you and the, well, the would, food. And, yeah. What would you like for lunch today? Yeah. And you have a trailer, you have a dressing room. Um, and sometimes you'd get to keep some of the wardrobe that say, Oh yeah, you want those shoes? Right. You can have those shoes. Right. I'm like showing up to school with really cool Nikes that haven't come out yet or something. And did it change your status at school when you uh, oh, when you became successful? As yeah, a... that was the <laughs> yeah. that was the thing. And so it turned you from being a cool kid into a drama nerd. <laughs> you never did. Well, yeah, I was a drama nerd. I did go to performing arts uh, schools. And the magnet school is Bancroft is a performing arts school, but um, it it did like I was still the nerd, but also. I was getting a lot of really cool looks from people that said, hey, man, I saw you on that commercial uh, for Rice Krispies or whatever it was. Yeah. And, you know, and feels pretty good. It felt pretty good to get the feedback from other people like, oh, that's cool. How'd you do that? Or do you get free Rice Krispies or, you know, uh, it's, I started <laughs> to get free Rice Krispies. <laughs> I did not get free Rice Krispies. <laughs> that day I got all I could yeah, eat. Right. Hoarded them. Uh, and I, I didn't want to eat another Rice Krispies after fil <laughs> filming that commercial. Because you... You're, you're eating that bowl, yeah. you know, a hundred times. Oh, yeah. I learned that lesson uh, really early on when I got into town. I had a, a small part in 61, which was the Roger Maris home run thing uh, yeah. HBO did. Yeah. And it was a, a sports writer's conference room. And they were like, anybody smoke? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I smoke. <laughs> 45 cigarettes later. You're like, I don't I, smoke. I was, I was smoking. I was, I was gray. I, I mean, literally, you'd have a cigarette and you'd go like, uh, your cigarette's too long. I smoked that down. I was like, oh my God. I'm like, by the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, 
You got to be careful when you're doing eating scenes, smoking scenes. Be careful about how much you consume because you have to keep doing takes and takes and different angles, different setups. Well, I mean, on our show, Scott was brilliant at it. I mean, he'd, you know, he'd been in the business a long time. And I, I learned because the first few feeding scenes, eating scenes at dinner, I was just wolfing down my chicken and vegetables. And, yeah. you know, an hour later, you're like, I, I might I might throw up. <laughs> but Scott yeah. would specifically do it every time the same way. So we'd wind up maybe having two bites of something per take. Right. You know, I'd like, I need another chicken breast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you gotta you gotta pace yourself and you learn these things as you go uh, you know as you go yeah oh, the fine art of eating without actually eating yeah yeah, yeah. i you noticed know, i know your food now. around the plate yeah. yeah you do a lot of prepping you know uh-huh. you're cutting it and talking in the middle and then you you might get mid-bite and say something <laughs> to somebody right before you're about to go uh-huh. hey you know one, one thing i wanted to ask you you know one of those type things exactly keep that thing in the fork right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. be careful when you eat you write it the last second you might mm. boom you can do a bite that's the way to do it otherwise yeah. you're miserable yeah um, i had this scene once where my boyfriend had to uh chug beer and they had real beer oh and we did maybe three or four maybe five takes, but by the end of it, he's pouring the beer on his head and he's just going nuts. And I'm like, oh my God, he's, he's getting drunk. He's drunk. Yeah. 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 He's and it happened really fast. Sure. Yeah, it does. It Can was... you imagine uh, being on the set of Scarface when they're, when... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, three takes, three takes in Pacino is like, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Nobody can deal with no, that. He was right. really doing exactly. it. He was really doing it. Not a lot of people know that. Was he? Oh, no. I just made oh. No, we don't know. We don't know, but definitely. <laughs> that big giant pile on the desk. <laughs> yeah. He must have learned that lesson. Like, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. We got this covered? We got this covered, right? Yeah. <laughs> Did you have any recurring stuff or anything like that prior to doing Deep Space Nine? Um, No. No. I, I was doing like... Um, video corporate videos for like Vons. I was doing like an educational series for that I think that still runs on economics. It was called Econ and Me. And uh that was a series, an educational series. So that worked that was like my entrance into like doing series work and being working, you know, working in the same place location and filming over a period of maybe three months, I think, for that one. Um so that was my first experience with that. But no, I hadn't done anything. And I hadn't watched Star Trek prior to the, getting the audition. You yeah. know? Um, I just I just went in there and, and read it like a cold read, you know, basically. Right. How I would do it. What's your first day like on the set? You're, you're 13. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Um, well... The first day on the set, I was probably I was fourteen by then. I was thirteen when I started auditioning for it. It took a while before the audition and the production beginning. Right. Uh, what was your audition? What was your audition process like? We all have different ones, you know. Some people were like, "You had one, you got the gig." I had six. Yeah, so it's always interesting to hear the different. Yeah, I had stories. three auditions. I had uh, the first audition. I remember it was about a hundred kids in the room. Right. The uh, second audition, I remember about 20 kids. And the third audition I saw was me and two other kids. Right. And uh, so it was three of us. I knew I was down to three. I had a good chance. And I think, you know, from my recreating and, you know, I don't have a clear memory of it. I was really young. But having conversations with people, um. Avery was in that final audition. I wondered about that. And uh, according to him, you know, he said that I gave him a big hug, called him dad as soon as I walked in the door. <laughs> and that was enough to kind of. Really? Yeah. That's oh, wow. so sweet. And I was, you know, I was a young kind of adult, mature guy. So I had cologne on and a collared shirt. So he, when he gave me the hug, he said, who is this young kid wearing cologne? <laughs> You know, you got somewhere to go after this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what kind was it? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I, I probably polo. I was going to say yeah. back then it, it would probably been polo. Yeah, <laughs> old school. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Might have been Jupe. Jupe uh-huh. was also, also one of those things. <laughs> awesome. How long did it take to sort of feel comfortable in, you know, you'd never, you weren't really familiar with it, Star Trek? Yeah, it took me right away. Really? Yeah, no, I, I was playing the kid. So, you know, I felt like I'm the kid. And there's nothing really to play there except for just be myself and be a kid. Um, I didn't really feel any pressure. And Avery Brooks was really comfortable with me and made me feel comfortable. And also, I knew he was going to be teaching me as I, as I went along. So it was like an extension of school for me. Right. Almost like, okay, so I'm taking drama classes and I'm also going to be on set learning from the masters, watching them perform. Um. Did you have a good relationship with him? Yeah, superb relationship. Yeah. yeah. He was like a father figure um, and and did a lot of fatherly things for me. Wow. Uh, off the camera as well, not just on camera. Um, I, you know, I've met him a few times and he's an enigma, at least to me. You know, I'm, I'm sure you don't have that relationship with him, but there's always something sort of like, you know, there's some sort of light around him. Uh, he's such a, he's a unique human being. Yeah, he is a unique uh, person and he's had um, a spectacular kind of incredible life um, from where he started to where he ended up, um, what he's seen growing up in uh, Gary, Indiana and the obstacles that he overcame to become a, a, a successful black actor in this business is not easy. Um, and especially having the length of success that he's had um, right. throughout decades of his career. Do you still talk to him? Yeah. 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 That's good. Scott won't return my call. <laughs> oh, oh, Connor. That's not true. <laughs> no, Scott's a good guy. Oh, actually. Scott's a great guy. He's yeah. actually a fantastic person. When I first met Scott, I only think I met him a couple times, but the first time I met him, I was like, Obviously, I know him from Quantum Leap. Right. And I love that show. I, you know, used to pretend that I would be him or, you know, fantasize about my own sure. Quantum Leaps in my own mind. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I was this huge fan of his show and just him. But when I met him, I thought, he is a really good guy and he deserves whatever success he has. In the yeah. Movie business yeah he definitely uh has done it the right way which is his way you know he's just a a thoroughly kind human being and um kind of the definition of a leader you know he definitely was well there's a reason why they pick these people for for captains they're not they're not accidentally picked to be captains i mean the whole infrastructure of people that are going through the filtering process to get them you know they're looking for certain qualities and characters they're looking for what you described about avery about the kind of enigma that he is that is the image that they want that's the kind of leadership that they want um as a captain on the show and so they picked him for those very same qualities you know we bitch a lot as actors about like you know why didn't i get that why didn't i get this i had a great audition Mm -hmm. you know for the most part they, they get it right. They get it right. Yeah. You know, and when it's not you. There's a reason. There is a reason. Exactly. Yeah. You could do it. But Ju- there's somebody else who just has a different kind of like. Who walked in like it. Yeah. Zhuzh, that yeah. that was. Yeah. Well, has it ever happened to you? Have you ever gone out for something and watched it and said, oh, that guy. Yeah. Way better than that. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I, just just, everything just, I go just recently. I did, uh, what was it? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Why did I even go? What there was, um, what was it, the Julia Roberts, Sean Penn, Gaslit, I think it was, about okay. um, about the Watergate thing. And I, I was sure that I was going to be John Dean's lawyer. Unfortunately, I look a little too much like John Dean <laughs> okay. and not the lawyer. And uh, I, I know the guy who wound up getting the part. And I watched it and I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they they got it right they got it yeah. right. All right dang it <laughs> yeah that happened to me um <clears throat> it was a movie called paid in full i wanted this movie so bad it was a character called ace and it was loosely based on jay-z's life uh, of course they don't admit that in the movie but it is mm-hmm. 
and it's produced by Jay-Z's uh, production company or one of his offshoots. But anyways, I wanted this role. I thought I'd, I thought I'd nailed the audition. You know, you walk out, you feel really good. You're like this, you know, I got this. Can I get some feedback? Yeah. I feel like I might have a chance at this. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll take notes, whatever you sure, want. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then I didn't get it. And so I kind of boycotted it, you know, when it came out. I was like, I'm not watching that movie. And, and then I finally did watch it. And then the guy who's uh, who got the role, uh, an actor named Wood Harris, who is a friend of mine now and who's, you know, a really good friend of mine. I thought he killed that movie. I mean, like, like murdered it. Like right. he was phenomenal in this movie. Right where it's become one of my favorite movies, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and I tell him that when I see him, you know? And, and so, yeah, there's, uh, they get it right. Yeah. They get it right. Yeah. I mean, to the point where with my experience, you know, they, I punted my first audition. It was like, you know, I'd had three that day, pilot, back yeah. in the day when you had when three you pilot had auditions. Them. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I, 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 I don't know what the other two were, and then I had Enterprise, and I was not, you're like, all right, just what, where's the script? I'll, I'll, I'll do it here. Basically, I walked in not knowing anything in any, any of the lines. It right. was like 12 pages. Walked in and... You're reading, you're reading. I can feel the room just disappear on me. Ron Serma's, you know... Yeah. Connor, okay. <laughs> Come back in an hour. <laughs> and I came back in. But, you know, at the end of it all, I did have a conversation with him years later. And he was like, yeah, I mean, you weren't very good in your first audition. But there was something about you that fit this role perfectly right. that we wanted to see you, see more of you. Huh. And uh, yeah, you know, so sometimes Six it works. Six more of you. Six more of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you Many know, more we, times. a lot of times we think it's something that we can do in our performance, right? So we're looking and we're like, maybe if I say this line differently, maybe if I uh, raise my voice here or if I change my emotion, inflection points, all that stuff when we're interpreting how to do a performance. But <clears throat> There are innate characteristics in who we are as people that just shine through in general. Mm -hmm. And that's probably, I'm, you know, what Ron saw in you, what he saw in me. It's something about, oh, yeah, that's the kid, that kid. He's, you know, he's, he's got the air of the, you know, he looks like that kid. They can see it. Mm -hmm. They can see it. Yeah. Forget about what I say. Yeah. Right. We can, we'll figure, he'll figure out how to say whatever he's got to say. Yeah. But it's the aura. So, you know, Connor, I, I know you to be like a, a stand-up guy, uh, a good person, funny. Like, those are the kinds of things that shine in just who you are. Uh -huh. And honest, honesty. Like, I, I believe you when you say stuff. You know, I don't think you're bullshitting. And I think those are the things that when they look at you at the audition, it doesn't matter really all the other things that you think so much are yeah. about performance, right? Right. It's those things. It's like, look at his eyes. Right. He sounds like, you know, I believe him. He's telling the truth. He's not bullshitting me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's that, there's that idea that they've made 85% of their decision about you by the time you've walked through that door. Right. It's just in that way with relationships, right? I mean, yeah, you, you see somebody and you're like, it's, you get this spark. You're like, oh, I can envision myself being with that person. It happens instantly. Yeah. And then the rest is the follow up. Right. But right. Right away. It's like there's this there's there's that switch. There's that flip. There's that attraction. There's there's that innate thing that's in you that doesn't require words. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's well said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Mark, you can speak to this producing movies and being involved in casting. And, you know, that very thing we're talking about yeah. is, is absolutely, yeah, it's absolutely clear. It's for, yeah, that happens all the time. And uh, spending a little time just having a quick conversation with you is far more important than any reading of any lines I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Like when you were talking about the, the, the English audition, the British audition for theater. Yeah. Um, with Dominic and with, uh, well, Andy was saying, you know, when he, when he was, uh, when he was cast in, um, uh, what was it? Uh, Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry, Dirty Harry. as Scorpio or Scorpion Scorpio. or whatever. Um, he didn't audition for it. He just met the director and he was like, back in those days, that's what you did. You just mm -hmm. talked to, you just right. talked yeah. to him, you know, and they got a sense of it. You didn't have to read. And, uh, because well, they knew your comprehension level. So it's just like, Oh, he, he gets what the stories are, but he understands what we're trying, trying right. to do here. He knows what part he would play in this story, and he's able to explain it to me. 
Yeah. Um, I, I got it. I've, I've gotten jobs like that. I, I, I booked a, a basketball movie that I did. And uh, I, I came in there with a basketball. I was the only guy at the audition with a basketball, so I'm dribbling the hallways. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you're trying to go for a basketball movie, it helps to bring one. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm in the hallways dribbling basketball, ready to go for the audition. But I get in there, and the guy sees me. He's like, oh, you got a basketball. I'm like, yeah. And I start doing my little moves. He's like, okay. So right away, he gets what we're trying to do. Yeah. And then the, it went to a conversation and not the script. It mm. went and went into, yeah, so we're trying to do this movie about basketball and this character is like this. And I'm like, and, and you're going to be the kind of guy that, you know, doesn't want a white boy coming in the gym thinking he runs the gym and this and that. And so, oh, yeah. And so we started having this kind of conversation. And it, that, that led up to the, the, the reading didn't matter at that point. Right, mm. right. The reading was just, you know, a matter of just... All right, just let's get this over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, just 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 read the lines and okay, let's go for that. But when I walked out of there, I already knew I got that job. Yeah. Wow. Because of the conversation. Right. Because it was like, oh, we made a connection. I understood what the project was about. I understood what my role with yeah. the project would be. And that's kind of how it, it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be. Now it's a bunch of Zoom and <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's a whole it's different a, world. I mean, different t- I will yeah. say that, you know, going in with a basketball, I went in for I did a Jesus I did a futuristic uh, Three Musketeers pilot years ago, yeah. and uh, you know I was going in for one of the Musketeers, and well I just gotten out of drama school, and of course I had a rapier. Oh no! So, you did. So I brought it with me. Oh I love yeah. it. Yeah, I did I a couple it. of things, and they were like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you know what you're doing, and I was like, yeah, but even th- but behind them, th- some of those producers or executives kind of like this whack job, <laughs> goddamn rapier. <laughs> but where's your where's the ren fest you're gonna be yeah, at soon we get, yeah, show sad <laughs> stage comment <laughs> exactly yeah yeah um, don't bring a gun to one of your gangster auditions guys don't do that no <laughs> yeah. yo fool what'd you say uh sir <laughs> yeah we're gonna have to ask you to leave yes yeah you can have a job but not really yeah right yeah <laughs> thanks so much <laughs> yeah uh your what was the convention circuit like when you did you do them um i didn't do them until a little bit later um, not like not right away. I didn't know anything about conventions when we started, but, um, eventually I got invited to a convention. It was in Pasadena. That was my first convention. Oh, it, so right here. Yeah. It was a creation convention. And, uh, because I hadn't done conventions, there was a big, uh, you know, anticipation for me to be somewhere. Right. So it was, it was, you know, it was my longest line I've ever had at a convention, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh, he's finally here. So, and so that was great. And, but it wasn't because they set me up outside. It was the first time I've ever been set up to sign autographs outside, like a table. You mean outside, outside? Outside. Oh. Like outdoors, not inside the convention the hall. Yeah. <laughs> So I was outside and I was like, okay, I, I have first convention. I don't know. Right. I don't know anything. So I'm sitting outside, you know, blazing sun. I, I wore a, uh, a, a suit jacket and a tie and everything. Oh, yeah. It's first convention. Sure. I, I was young too. So I think I'm about 16 at this time, but there was a huge line. And I was like, whoa, this is like, like a thousand people. Like I didn't expect this. Right. I, like, I, I've, I don't know what to do. Right. So I'm sitting there. I'm signing autographs. I'm signing. The sun goes down. It's like I'm sitting there for like six hours. It's a thousand people. Constantly. Just, Does your hand get tired? My hand's getting tired. <laughs> Do you it's, forget how to sign your name after yeah, a while? Yeah, you start forgetting yeah. how to spell your name. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I got two R's. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you literally forget how to spell your name. Yeah. And and so then the line's going and going. And, and finally, I realize I'm not going to get through this fucking line. Right. This is not going to happen. It's nighttime. So now I can't even see. <laughs> Jesus. And, and it's getting I cold. I can't spell my right. name. I yeah. can't see. I can't spell my name. I can't see. It's getting cold. I'm dressed for the summer. Starts What's... to feel more like abuse than <laughs> Yeah. Than now I'm like, I got to go, man. Yeah. But, and the convention ends at like six, but it's seven. You know, so I'm, it's over the time of the convention. The convention's already gone. You're the last one there. But I'm, the only I'm, the, I'm the only one person in the, <laughs> side, in the parking lot, right? <laughs> so finally, they cut, the, they cut the line off. And then uh, the guy who they cut the line off. He's like, 
No, that's that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, I've been waiting all day. I've been here for four hours and this and that. Um, and I felt him too, you know. He's yeah. him and all the people that got cut off. So he decided to attack me and jump over the table. Whoa. What? And really? looked like he was gonna choke me out or something. Yeah. What happened? Uh, Fan gone bad. You no, know, I had a, I had my you know s- escort handler guy who are me. always really effective at being a bodyguard, <laughs> right? I mean, except this guy was at oh, the was moment. He? Yeah, he was like like a like a biker dude or something. Lucky you. Lucky me. I get this like Hell's Angels guy <laughs> <laughs> who comes out and just like grabs the other guy and protects me, you know, from that moment. And then I get shielded out and they're like, walk me out of the thing. And, but that guy's, and I ended up meeting him just last, this last creation convention, the guy who stood up for me. He was like, hey, Oh, hey. really? Yeah. Oh, the guy who stood up for you. The, the guy, guy who stood up for me. I was the me. guy who attacked no, you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. It was me. That Can guy, I finally get that autograph? Yeah, okay. yeah, here you go. <laughs> no, the guy who stood up for me, I finally met him. He's, um, you know, he's, he's older now. This was, this was like, more than 30 years ago, right? So or, or close to 30 years ago. And he was already an adult. So now he's like in a wheelchair and he's an older man. And he's like, you remember that uh, convention you did in Pasadena? I was like, yeah. He's like, I was the guy that stopped the other guy from jumping over on you. No <laughs> way. And That's I'm like, awesome. you're that dude. Aww. That's awesome. So <laughs> we ended up, you know, reconnecting and I gave him some autographs. And um, it was great to kind of hear his his version of the story. Yeah, from his yeah. Perspective. And we right. never talked about it. Because, you know, usually the people who were minding you, if they had to run 30 yards, they might get 20 out of it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, this guy no was... offense to you lovely people. You, you help us a great deal, but I don't really feel like as though if somebody comes across the table, no, I've I, never had someone like that. I got lucky on this moment. And then it kind of turned me off on conventions. I was like, is this what conventions is like? You know, <laughs> yeah, these, exactly. These guys are crazy. It's, just, it's, it's hand-to-hand combat. <laughs> yeah, I got to be prepared for this. <laughs> I want indoor and I want a, I want a cage. Uh, buzz you in. Uh, so, no, it was uh, it was kind of a turnoff for the first convention. But ever since then, I've really enjoyed my experiences. Just traveling the world and getting an opportunity to see different places, meet fans across the world. Uh, it's just it's like remarkable when you see that people in Italy or in Germany or in Australia or yeah, it's just everywhere around the world that they, you know, that they uh, watch the show and they know, they know about it. So it's been a humbling thing. To yeah. We're very lucky. Yeah. We're very lucky. I Super. mean, I, I can't think of any other franchise that has anything like that. I mean, there's no, there's no law and order conventions around the world that you can no there are not there i don't think so yeah you know i mean no. you'd think that there would be but this in particular these fans have um you know they've they've continued to change our lives especially the the legacy trek is that what they're calling it now? yeah well, the, we're, the old, we're the old guys the legacy guys. <laughs> legacy guys golden age legacy the ones who shot on film oh. yeah i've in my own podcast i actually have uh your name keeps coming up all the time trip talker trip it's because <laughs> and I, it's because he wore the blue underwear. Yeah, is it? I, mean, I, mean, yeah. I don't know, but you're definitely a uh, a sex symbol for the fans, and they definitely won't forget about you. So, <laughs> well, he's, a, he's a sex symbol uh, for me. I, I can I can live on uh, on, on the small screen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, do you mind talking about Aaron a bit and uh, no. um, what it was like uh, working with him and being his friend and, and doing the podcast and yeah um um yeah i love aaron um he was uh very serious about his work and when we were working together on the show he was adamant about rehearsing and about uh practicing his voice and making sure that his delivery was accurate he was uh, like a perfectionist about his work wow and, and then, just, I don't mean to interrupt, but just to be clear, we're talking about Aaron Eisenberg. Yeah, the late, uh, great Aaron Eisenberg. Yeah, who played yeah. Nog on Deep Space Nine. Yeah. yeah. And who you started your podcast. So right. Always. Aaron is the, um, you know, he's the brainchild behind the podcast. Um, he approached me with it and said, would you be interested in doing a podcast with me? Right. And um, I was like, sure. 
Um, you know, I was going through some things in my life at that time. And I remember him saying, yeah, I know you're like a, a hermit, like a recluse, but would you mind doing the podcast <laughs> with me? And I was like, who told you I was a hermit? <laughs> I was like, what's going on? Who's, who's spreading this information about me? It's not that way. It's not that way. I, you know, I'm building a family. I got a restaurant. You know, I'm at a bar. Um, so, no. Um, then then he's like, we have to watch Star Trek. And that's when I was like, no, I can't do this. Yeah, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> oh, heavens. I was like, I can't watch Star Trek on a podcast. No, 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 no. And so he's like, no, come on. You just got to do it. Just watch some Star Trek. It'll be cool. And so I had to um, confess, actually, at, at his funeral to him about a truth that uh, I was hiding. And, um, you know, at his funeral, I confessed because I really was hiding this and it was I had to get it off my chest. Mm. Um, I confessed to Aaron that I hadn't watched any of the Star Trek episodes. <laughs> Oh. That you guys were talking about? When we were originally doing the first few episodes of this podcast, mm -hmm. I would just show up and pretend like I watched the episode. <laughs> right. You'd have Act. enough information to sort of fake it. <laughs> exactly. So instead of watching the episodes, I would watch somebody else's podcast about the episode. Oh, 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 oh wow. So you watched something. <laughs> I watched something. Yeah. But I couldn't watch I it firsthand. <laughs> So, you just remarkable. couldn't bring yourself to do that. I couldn't do it in the beginning. So he would be like, you remember that scene? And I'm like, the guy never said anything about that scene. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, oh no, my God. I had no comments oh. for him on, on uh, different things. Or you things. just sort of build off of what he said. Yeah, I would, he would be like, you know how the director kind of moved that camera angle? And I, I would be so lost in those moments. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, who was the director at that point? Yeah, and you know, David Livingston, he's awesome. You know, David is a great guy. And I, I, I had no, I hadn't watched it. All I did was watch this, somebody else's podcast and I would try to find the shortest one. Right. <laughs> you know, oh so, my God. so it only meant I had to commit 10 minutes, you know, while mm -hmm. I was drinking my coffee in the morning. He never caught on. He, he kept asking me. <laughs> yeah. So he might have a little bit. Yeah. He, he kept he asking knew. me. He's like, uh. You didn't remember that scene where the, <laughs> where the girl died? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the girl. Right. I thought you meant. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I I had to confess to him at the funeral. I was like, Aaron, I, I never watched any of that stuff, bro. And I'm sorry I was faking it. Aww. And uh, this is a funeral, by the way. And yeah. somebody yells from the funeral. We know. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> 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 And I'm like, oh, I got busted. Oh, man. That must have gotten a laugh. It did get a laugh. Yeah. It got a huge laugh. But oh I, 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 we I actually, all knew. Yeah. yeah. I'm, like, I'm talking to a bunch of Star Trek, you know, aficionados <laughs> trying to wing it. And they're like, there's no way he's watched this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this ought to be fun. Wing it. Some fans' questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Fran Castile from Patreon asks, describe what it was like growing up on a space station. Um, you know, one thing is that the, those guys who did the set design were amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, and they still are amazing. Those guys are as good as it gets. If I ever really come in some money, I, I want my house design by one of their set designers. <laughs> I have cool. a Cardassian house. Yeah, I'll I'll totally do it. You, my my living room could look like the bridge. I don't care. Was it was Herman Zimmerman do, did he had yours yeah. as well? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Genius. Yeah. And they, they put together the promenade was so realistic looking. I mean the, the shops here and there and it was a two story like you can go upstairs, you had a spiral staircases in it. It was it was functional. It was like a like being at the Beverly Center. You right. Know? So right. it was huge, and it was enough space to walk where you could walk around the corner and nobody could see you. So it was huge. Yeah. And uh, also the cargo bay and all of this uh, other stuff, the main ops, all of that stuff was so well done. And um, that added to the ability to kind of put yourself in the f fantasy of mm -hmm. being in that world. And that was what it was like. It was like actually being there um, and and making that place real right 
Um, so, and then also going to the bathroom and seeing a Cardassian next to you or Klingon. Hysterical. Yeah, where you're just like at the Paramount, you know, yeah. bathroom. <laughs> That's right. And you look over and there's a Klingon standing there and you're or some weird alien and you're just like, What is my life? This is my life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is what it's going to be like. <laughs> I'm at the urinal exactly. with a Klingon. Right. And he's like, Can you zip me up in the back? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that that was what it was like. But it was fantastic, too, just the fact that I, I if I could, I'd ov- obviously go back and do it, you know, or do it again. Yeah. If, if I could re- reinvent it, but um, it was some of the greatest time of my life. And um, it just flies by so fast because it is so great. Yeah. This is from Stephanie Baker. Hi, Stephanie. Stephanie. Uh, from Patreon. How has your Star Trek experience influenced you as a parent? That's a good question, Stephanie. Um, you know, Avery Brooks. Like, I, I go back to Avery because he was such a role model and influence in my life. He led by example. Didn't go around preaching to me about do this and do that or do this. He just led by example. He led by how he respected people. He led by, um, I remember him knowing everybody on the crew's name first and last. He always called people Mr. Mel Dykes, Mr. Bono. He would always... Wow. right call people by their first, by their surname, you know? Right. And so, uh, so those are kinds of things that you watch and you observe as a young person and say, oh, this is how the guy I want to emulate carries himself. Right. He speaks in this kind of way. He's articulate. He uh, He's a gentleman with women. He's uh, respectful with his coworkers. He takes his work seriously. He shows up on time. He's the, you know, first one in, last one out. Those are the kinds of things that you learn. And then most importantly, he was very soft and loving with me and delicate. He would bring me in for a hug and he would give me a kiss on the top of my forehead and uh, show me actual physical affection, which I was lacking from a male's point of view at that time. Mm. My mom did that that for me, but I never really got it from a a male point of view, because at that point my parents were divorced. And so Avery taught me a lot about being affectionate, um, also assertive and, and making, you know, this is what needs to be done and I'm going to hold you accountable, mm-hmm. but also I'm going to show you some love and right. I'm on your team and I'm on your side and I'm here to support you. And so for me, that's the most, uh, the biggest lessons that I took, Carrying forward with my own daughter now, who's 11, is just giving her a hug, giving her a kiss, you know, kiss on the forehead. Tell you love her. Yeah, mm-hmm. tell her I love her. You know, my favorite thing to do is say, uh, I wish somebody would give me a hug right now. <laughs> and I would just I would just kind of put that question. I always mm-hmm. do that. And then she hears, and obviously, you know. And so we're, we have that kind of a connection, and that's one of the biggest things for me. Well, it sounds like it. Oh, wow. Your experience with Avery in particular came at a really important time in your life. Yeah, it came at a very important time because my parents uh, were divorcing around 11, 12 in that time. Mm -hmm. So almost right when I around the time just before I got the show, you know, Avery comes in as this like surrogate father for me, kind of like he stepped in and filled the role. My dad was going through personal things. Uh, uh, Addiction was a big issue for him. Mm -hmm. And so he was unavailable um, mentally, kind of checked out dealing with his own addiction. And so having a male role model like Avery, who was so classy, so educated, and such about uh, principles of righteousness and family values, um, that came at the right moment for me when I needed that inspiration. Right. What a blessing. Yeah, truly. Yeah. All right, next question is from Bill Erickson from Patreon. Thanks, Bill. Uh, where do you fish for real? If I'm going to fish, I'm going <laughs> to fish with War Dog. Hi, <laughs> Bill Erickson. No, he knows I I, I don't fish, but uh, the only time I fished was in the pilot episode of The Emissary. Um <laughs> And that's the only time I've seen you're in the first scene I'm in and the only time I've ever had a fishing pole in my hand. (laughs) (laughs) So you fish on set. 
Yeah, no, I, I fish at the grocery store right in the frozen <laughs> section. That's where I do most of my fishing. Um, and no, um, I, I, I've never been, Bill, I'm going to take you up on that offer. We'll go together one day and you show me how to stand around and wait for a fish to bite on the hook. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Jan Eric Hearn uh, from Patreon. Thanks, Jan. What kind of relationship does he have with his space dad, Mr. Avery Brooks, nowadays? Oh, or the just, rest of the yeah. DS9 cast? So we talked yeah. about Avery, but yeah, what I have about a the good rest relationship. Of the cast? Thanks to um, doing the podcast, you know, um, Seventh Rule has allowed me a chance to really reconnect with people and even more so than just seeing them at conventions. Right. Because you get to even have more in depth discussions. And then I'm talking about their performance on stuff that I've actually watched now. And so I can connect with them on that as far as just what they bring as an actor. Right. Um, by the way, uh, what you bring as an actor, I, I remember seeing you. I, I, I might not have watched your show, but I did watch you on uh, American Made. Is that the oh, one? yeah. Where I played George Bush. I played George Bush. <laughs> and I, I, I damn near jumped out of my seat. I was like, that's Connor. That's Connor playing the president. Oh, my God. I know the president. So, that's awesome. So, yeah, I, I was really pleased to watch you in that. Uh, I thought you were awesome in that, too. That, thank like, you. That was that was fun. Yeah, With they, Tom Cruise, right? With Tom Cruise, who, uh, uh, you know. I mean, he's he all right. Was, he, he was he, great he, yeah. to work with. Yeah. He's a great guy. I mean, you should help him out in his career and help him, you know, throw him some jobs. Well, yeah, <laughs> we talk every week. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. How that but is. I know I'll say, you know, he, he he gets he gets a rap. Yeah, you know, however you want to look at that. But I, you know, my experience with him was just top notch. He he could not have been more professional, friendly. He didn't go back to his trailer. He hung, we were in a courthouse and yeah. he hung out in the green room with everybody and we talked. And you know, I, I found myself just kind of going like. Well, let me knock off all the things that I thought about you that I was wrong about. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm, now, I've when, always loved his movies. When you're watching him perform, were you like, well, this is, this is it. This is the Tom Cruise stuff. Like I'm watching it in firsthand. Yeah. Yeah. Funny story. So uh, I go do the thing. And uh, the night before we're rehearsing and two scenes, there's a scene with the DEA agent and there's a scene with me and Tom just comes back from shooting and then we get into this conference room and they, and the poor writer is sweating in the back of the room. Cause he's like, he's rewriting this whole thing. Right. I got a couple ideas of my own that I want to talk about in my scene. Yeah. So they do it. They break the whole thing apart. They basically rewrite the whole thing. Cause Tom's going like, if I'm the audience, I don't believe this. I don't, exactly. You know? And so they retooled it and uh, I'm just, I'm chomping at the bit for my turn. So two hours go by. We go upstairs to rehearse my scene and uh, we rehearse it. And he looks at me, the director, and he just goes louder. And I was like, I was about to ask a question. I thought, you know, I'm going to wait till I'm going to go louder on this one. I <laughs> do this rehearsal louder. And he goes, all right, that's great. We'll see you tomorrow. And I was like, uh, well, oh, that's a rehearsal, right? Yeah. You know, no camera or anything. And I was like, cause they'd taken some lines out of the scene. And I was like, I think maybe we should put those back in. But on the day, in the scene, Tom's like, we got to flesh this out a little bit. I was like, are you cool just sort of like riffing? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. You know, and we did it a few times. And uh, yeah, he's super, he's a great scene partner, um, you know. So you guys just kind of went off the script for a little a, bit? A little bit, yeah, yeah. We talked about how Bush was a, um, he was a pilot. And um, we added some stuff about, him being a pilot in the National Guard, and you know, because Tom knows all this stuff, he's he could, he's right, probably he was what, in the Air what Force. What does right? Tom know about the uh, Air Force or about being a pilot? About being, about being, about being, nothing what does at he know all. about yeah, being a exactly. pilot? Yeah, I think Not he flew an F uh, F fourteen. Uh, <laughs> but no, he he was great. He was great. Um, but again, you know, the morning of though, I will say this. You know, I've always said that I don't care who I work with. You know, you never just you put our pants on the same way. I got in the van and was like, "You gonna throw up?" You, you might throw up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Our next question is from Mars from Patreon. Thanks, Mars. What could DS9 or the industry in general have done to improve your childhood, if anything? I 
think you talked about it a bit with Avery, but anything else? To improve my childhood. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they could have paid me more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, would have, that would have improved my adulthood <laughs> as well. Um, you know, actually, I, I do have a, uh, a a thought that I will add for that because in this industry, actually in the world, you can't have child labor, right? It's kind of a, a bad thing now ever since those uh, child labor laws were passed. And there's a reason for that, because, you know, you're exploiting children and uh, putting them in harm's way, affecting their growth. And I feel like if you're going to be having children working in this industry, breaking the norms of child labor laws, then there has to be some accountability for those studios to ensure uh, some sort of employment, gainful employment for those children, some kind of retainership program where those children are given either executive opportunities or some way to continue to earn a living. The, the, those kids can't sacrifice their whole life, the Macaulay Culkins, the, anybody who's a child actor, and not have the opportunity once the studio say, oh, yeah, you know what? You're grown up now. You're not as cute anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. And we don't need you. Right. But yet you threw away parts of your life that you could have dedicated to being a lawyer, doctor, get your degrees, da, 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 da. All of this other stuff that would have set you up in the long term. You threw that away or gave that away for the benefit of these studios. And I think that there has to be some kind of accountability there for the studios to say, if we're going to take ki kids and we're going to alter the course of their life, then we also have to make sure that they have a chance to make a living in some sort of way. I mean, Gary Coleman was doing security at the mall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's not right. Mm -hmm. Right. Because somebody made a lot of money off of Gary Coleman. And there's certainly a way in, in, for these studios to have a program where these Gary Coleman's of the world are maybe teaching other young kids who are going to be child actors and say, these are the things you're going to look uh, be forward to. And these right. are the things, the hurdles you'll, you'll, you'll face. There has to be some kind of retainment for these people. Everybody else gets a career for life. All the electricians are working for the rest of their life. Yeah. All the DPs are working. All of the camera operators, all of the sound engineers are working. But these, and they're not outgrowing that. And they're not outgrowing it. But these kids are are outgrowing their cuteness or their usefulness mm -hmm. and not eventually not being set for life in a, in a way that they can be set for life. So I do think that there needs to be something there that changes. A sense of responsibility. On the studios. Yes. Because you're taking a child's life. Right. Yeah, that's really And altering the course of what they could become. Right, mm -hmm. right. I thought of that. Good answer. Yeah. Yeah, that is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like an ROTC program where if you, or whatever it is in the military, if you serve, yeah. when you come back, they'll put you through school so that you can get a career once you're yeah. Yeah, career. Something. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, something. Yes, something. Right. Something. You can't just use the kids for their cuteness and say, okay, now you got pimples. Yeah. 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 We're done. Yeah, it's like a racehorse. I mean, like, now you're out to pasture. Sorry, you don't. You can't serve us anymore. Mm -hmm. So now you're done. See you. Thanks. Yeah, see you. We don't care what happens to you. Right. Uh that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Disney is, does the best job of uh, keeping their young talent employed for the rest of their lives. In my opinion, Disney has done well for the Justin Timberlakes, Britney Spears, and Raven Simones, and so, so on and so forth. There are people that have fell off through the cracks, but they keep their people kind of gamefully employed. Hmm. hmm. That's really interesting. We were actually talking because we were talking about you're the only guest we've had where it's like you were a kid. Yeah. Most yeah. of your life has come since Star Trek. Right. From like 14 to 21, you know? Yeah. It's like 13 to 21. You take that piece of uh, life from any person and they're going to be set back. That's your high school years, your beginning of college years. It's a lot of time to take away from somebody and then afterwards say, okay, we're done with you. Yeah, 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 we're, we're right. done. Good luck. Good luck in life. Yeah. 
you don't have any kind of I'm uh, gonna take your parking now. pass. Yeah, can you kiss me? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no more gift bags and right. uh, you know, uh, red carpet events for you. Exactly. So those guys don't have to be working security at a uh, at a mall. No. Yeah. That's that's not fair. Yeah. They could be working security any sort of, at the studio. That's right. Any sort of opportunity. Anything. 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 Because there's so many jobs. The, the crew alone, you know, how, it would have been. Did you direct anything? No, I didn't direct anything. Um, I wanted to, but, you know, I felt like I was too young and I'm working with all these. And, and they might have also thought you were too young. They would have thought I was too young. I know Renee is not taking orders from yeah. me. He's like, no, I refuse. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I did write. I wrote an episode, pitched it to Ira and the guys. Um, they were kind enough to listen to my pitch. And uh, they also told me they were not going to use my pitch uh -huh. uh, for very good reasons, you know, because the ideas were similar to Next Generation episodes that I had never seen. Right. So I oh. was plagiarizing something I didn't really know about. Um, my idea was to have people addicted to some kind of cocktail that was being served at uh, Quark's bar and uh, kind of like something that he would put in the drinks, some additive. And according to the writers, when I pitched it, they said it was similar to a Next Generation episode where people were addicted to a video game. Yeah. Oh. And so I didn't know that. Uh, so that was me. But I did pitch. I did write an episode. I printed uh, printed up a nice little 60-page script. Wow. And I got it done. And I was 18 when I did that. So yeah. I did that to nice. prove to myself, yeah, yeah, I could write an episode. Right. Right. That's very cool. Uh, That's might not awesome. be able to sell an episode, but I could write one. Exactly. <laughs> that must have felt good. Yeah. It felt good. It did feel good, yeah. Next question is from Amy Tudor uh, from Patreon. Thanks, Amy. What do you enjoy most about doing the Seventh Rule podcast? I enjoy our uh, group of people that we meet with. I enjoy getting to know them and their lives and hearing their perspective. Um. I enjoy my partners, uh, Aaron, Ryan, uh, Melissa. Just, it's fun. Um, and also watching the show. I, I actually have made a 180 on how I feel about watching Star Trek. I, mm. I really detested it in the beginning. And I had to force it down my throat in the beginning. And now I am watching all of the new series. I'm going to have a rewatch or uh, a watch of the next generation which uh denise crosby is going to be joining us for for the first season oh nice yeah and uh so, how do you do that well we're just going to be watching the episodes and critiquing them and then meeting up for uh to talk about it together mm. And Denise says she's she's going to be watching the episodes too for the first time. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's not an unusual thing. It's not an unusual thing. Actually, a lot of actors have not watched it because they were there and they've watched. They watched. They were there. They did the performance. Maybe they've watched dailies. Uh, maybe they've watched it before in the past. You know, certain episodes here and there. So some uh, hate watching themselves, and some people hate watching themselves or are very critical of themselves when they do watch themselves. Right. I had a, this is a quick side story, but I had a house party one time and uh, knock on the door. I go to the door. Robert De Niro's there. Okay. <laughs> and he's like, is this the right house? I'm like, yep, the right house. This is the party. <laughs> so, what? yeah. So De Niro comes to my house or we're, we're hanging out. And uh, the first one there? No, he wasn't the first one there. Okay. It, that would be awesome. It, it was a it was a party. It was a rap. It was an after a rap party for a movie that he was working on. I'll say that. But uh, he shows up, and I'm thinking De Niro's here in my house in my living room. Uh, let me play something on the TV. <laughs> so I put in uh, Taxi Driver. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, De Niro, he kind of, you know, calls me over and he talks. He's a low talker. And he says, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 Take 
make that shit up is what I heard. He didn't say it, but I heard that. So I ran to the thing and people were like, well, no, what are you doing? I'm like, no, no. Yeah. yeah. No. It's a good move. <laughs> we're a nutty professor. Yeah. <laughs> Something else. A nutty professor. So uh, he did oh, not like to see himself own the thing or, or other people there watching. Right. Or, you know, with him there. So, uh, yeah, a lot of actors don't want to see themselves on screen. Yeah. Including some of the great ones. Some of the best. It? Yeah. We have our last fan question uh, yeah. from Michael Bruno from YouTube. A Rod Stewart version of the Enterprise theme song would have been awesome. Which TV series has the best theme song slash opening? My pick is The Six Million Dollar Man. Mm. <laughs> I like that. The best theme song slash opening? Yeah. I, know, I know mine. Which TV series has the best Rockford theme Files. Songs? Rockford Files. Hands down. That's the cop show? Jim Rockford. Is that what is that Rockford file? Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. You know what? Mine is a files too. I'm going to say X Files. I I, I oh, love that yeah. classic. Yeah. That sound and that yeah. X Files. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I liked. Um, well, I was a big Mad Men fan, so. But uh, the best one yeah. with words. <laughs> you know that could be a whole nother uh, category. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know. Um, cheers. Cheers. Sometimes, sure. yeah. yeah, yeah, that's gonna be up there. Everybody knows your name. I uh, catch myself saying "Cheers" was filmed in front of a live studio audience regularly, <laughs> like when I'm making. You have to remind you doing dishes or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who didn't want to be Sam Malone, man? Right. He's so cool. I actually worked with Ted Danson. He was one of those actors that I was kind of in awe of when I worked with him. It was mm -hmm. just like he was just talking like how we're talking, you know, and then and then he's he just like. Action. And, it, and, it, and it, he went into character so quick. Some people can do that. I was like, bro, I need like at least two seconds, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, All right, give me a second. Yeah. Like, he went from full, like, yeah, yeah, no, 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 action. And I was like, this guy is amazing. Mm -hmm. Some people have that. I, I do not. He, he was amazing. I was like, I was in awe of him while we were doing the scene. I'm just like, I'm looking at him in awe. Yeah. But still doing my scene. Right. But I know I must look like crap because I'm not paying attention. I'm just right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching it. You're like, right. I'm amazed. I'm like, this guy's amazing. Did you like him? Uh, I thought he was a great guy. He was a yeah. sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. He was a sweetheart. Um, worked with my, uh, Caruso. David Caruso. David, David Caruso. Caruso. Yeah. CSI. And it was, he was another guy that was like really intense. I've heard that. Super intense. Yeah. Where you're like, does he want to kick my ass? Yeah. I had a buddy who had a recurring part on CSI Miami, and he was like, yeah. it's a long day. Yeah. But he he, he kind of is like, like he wants, like, he's, like he wants to kick your ass. Yeah. You it know? comes across that way. Yeah. Yeah. So it works. It works 100%. And I, I was playing criminal, and I'm in the, you know, I'm in. I'm getting interrogated. So he walks into the room and you know, he's the glasses actor. Yeah, the exactly. World. He's the king of the glasses. So he's yeah. the glasses are on glasses, fold glasses in the hand, glasses come out, glasses go back on glasses. Might. Nope. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's just all glasses. Right, they're so right. good That's, with the glass. I mean, the whole thing is like, uh, they go in the pocket, they come back out again. And then yeah. right at the, you know, they're right. The last second he solves everything. He puts them off. And yeah. It's cool as shit. It's like he told the whole story with his glasses. Yeah. 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 I, I, and I'm sitting there watching the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Not even listening to him. It's all glasses. Yeah. So, the oh, whole I'm sorry. Glass. What's my line? Yeah, no, exactly. No, but you, we talked about uh, cues on when you eat, you know, so you're, you do a scene, you know exactly what, what line you're going to take the bite. Right? right. And you always take the bite at the same line. He would do the glasses things. At the exact same every take, yeah, they would. The glasses had their own choreography that sure. was memorized by him. Right, that's magic. Right, because yeah, if he screwed that up, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. So the glasses were like, I was like, dude, those glasses need a raise. Seriously, yeah, <laughs> oh, they're they doing all the acting. Are they on? Are they in the contract? <laughs> I wonder if they had a glasses coordinator. Somebody who was oh, like, I'm right, sure they, when, they, 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 yeah. when you look over them is when you actually take them off. Yeah, they're just constantly buffing them. Yeah. You know, there's just constantly the buffer. 
Are like you guys well. ready for Star Trek trivia? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. Let's do it. Yeah. You yeah. two versus producer Mark. All right. Here we go. We haven't done this in a while, so get ready. Now, are we uh, whoever answers first, or we all get our shot? Oh, so uh, it's multiple choice? Yes. Multiple, multiple choice. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, the buzzer is just say your name. So this is buzzer style. Okay, cool. All right. What is Chekhov's first name? Mark. Mark. Do you even Bobble? need? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Who, who thought of these questions? <laughs> I, I thought his name was Mark. I was like, <laughs> wow, Mark Chekhov. <laughs> Mark Chekhov. I didn't know that. <laughs> Doesn't, uh, didn't sound right. But... <laughs> the answer is C, Pavel Chekhov. Pavel. Yeah. Hey, hang on, though. You should read the whole question out with yes, all please, of the yes. answers, <laughs> and then we and can Mark, has, chime Mark in. has to hold himself back. Yeah, because otherwise Sorry, we're just going to sit here like, Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dumb and dumber. Has to hold himself do you back. want to do that one again? Well, should we um, just... No, no, we'll give you that well, one. well, you can have that I one. Can. Okay, question number two. Which of the following starships survived the Battle of Wolf 359? A, USS Awani. B, USS Yamaguchi. C, USS Melbourne. Or D, USS Saratoga. It's Ronner. What do you think? I'm going to say it's the Saratoga. I was going to say the Saratoga. Um, I think it's the Saratoga. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with you before she gives you the answer, because I think the Saratoga is listed in the episode uh, part two where that battle has taken place so as being named as one of the ships. That's this I think that was the Admiral's, or is that the Melbourne? This isn't fair. <laughs> Can this we call so, you producer nerd, so Mark? The only one that I never heard of is the Awani. <laughs> so it's the so Yam what, Yamaguchi? You, you're saying what? Is it, is, I'm going to say Awani. You say Awani? Okay. Yeah. So Saratoga. Yeah, we're gonna stick with Saratoga. So, what's the answer? Producer Mark is correct. It's a. It's U.S. Ah, I guessed. Oh, honey. That was a guess. Are you serious? That was a guess. Um, you know, although, you know the, what the winner gets? Rinse. Oh, <laughs> wash. Who gets to take care of the plant? Well, I'm already. Taking <laughs> <it>. <laughs> oh, well, poor wash. You might want to. You might want to dump this then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see well, where you're I, going with uh, that. Uh, <laughs> and thank you, Connor, for painting that picture of me. It looks really accurate, man. That's awesome. I was job. up late, late, late last night. Yeah. But you know what? On I, last I, minute, too. Yeah. You know what? I think it carries the essence. The eyes are perfect, <laughs> right? Thank you. The eyes have it. All right. Question number three Which Star Trek captain loves baseball? A. Cisco. B. Picard. C. Kirk. D. Archer. It's rock. It's got to be Cisco. This is Cisco. Yeah. This, is, this is definitely Cisco. Yeah. We got one. You least. guys got it. It's A, Cisco. All right. Yes. Yes. All right. We got one. I'm feeling good now. That's, yeah. We can walk away with our heads. That's high. right. We scored. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number four. Who convinced Nichelle Nichols not to leave Star Trek after the first season? A, Sidney Poitier. B, Gene Roddenberry. C, Lucille Ball. Or D, Martin Luther King Jr. Sir Connor. Connor. Yep. Yes. You got it. You got it. MLK. Yeah. yeah. We know that. Yeah. yeah. Two-two. All right. Woo. All right. <laughs> Mark's like, I just didn't even yeah. open my mouth. I knew that. <laughs> Nichols planned to leave Star Trek after the first season and return to musical theater, but a chance meeting with Martin Luther King Jr. convinced her to stay. He was a fan of the show and felt that her character signified a future of greater racial harmony and cooperation. Very cool. Did. You know, if anybody's going to give you a message, yeah. have it be him. <laughs> you know? Question yeah, number great. five. Which actor received death threats after Star Trek uh, Generations? A, Alan Ruck, B, William Shatner, C, Malcolm McDowell, or D, Patrick Stewart? Mark. Connor. Damn it. That was you, right? Malcolm McDowell. Correct. Because he killed Shatner, right? Uh, yes. Oh, because he killed Captain Kirk, correct. And, and killed Kirk. Yeah, and... Uh, Someone killed Shatner? Yeah, I was like, he's still alive. No, but I, I saw him recently. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, so, that's, so, that, that's uh, the fans taking a little Chris, bit too yeah, far. That's right. That's an exact, example producer of that. Producer Chris. That is producer Mark for the win. Woo! <laughs> oh, the W. You got the W. Wow. Uh, it's a real honor, man, just to be a part of it. The, the podcast space has been fantastic, too, because I get to meet more people, have deeper connections. Right. And get the stories out there. Um, but, yeah, man. Uh, and also, shout out to Dom, who's not with us. But, you know, got a lot of love for Dominic. He's a, an amazing guy. And he's a definitely uh, 
an unusual kind of one of a kind type of person. Yeah, they toss the mold out after they meet. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Just they're like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's gonna be one of these. Yeah, yeah. yeah only one. <laughs> We're cool with you, bro. You're yeah. good. Yeah. And, and, yeah, but he's such he's such a party. Like he's you know once you get his spirit, you know that he's coming from a good place, and, and he's such a good. He's just a fun guy to be around. Yeah, I mean, I I, I feel blessed. You don't get real true friends uh, often in your life. And um, uh, I credit the show for, you know, introducing us together. And he's he's one of my dearest friends and always will be the rest of my days. And, um, yeah, you know, it's yeah. we're fortunate. We are Two words fortunate. sum up, Dom, when I think of him. Uh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Is that accurate? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's all, that sums him up right there. Oh, my God. That was good. <laughs> Well, on that note, right? <laughs> That's a good ending place, right? right? I mean, seriously, man, thank you so much for coming. I know last minute uh, in particular, we were hoping to get you on. I'm glad we got you on. And it was, a, it was a, a fantastic chat. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah. Thank painless. you very, very much. Painless. Yeah, it was painless, right? <laughs> That's what we shoot for. Painless. Mostly painless. That was great. Mostly. Nobody jumped over a table at you. See y'all. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Please like, subscribe, and join us on Patreon. Thanks again for watching, and join us on Sundays for new shows.